you might be like me and have allergies. <laughs> I'm pretty fortunate because none of my allergies are life-threatening, but if I ever get close to a cat for too long, too many times, my eyes will swell up to the size of baseballs. I hope that your eyes swell up to the size of baseballs when you watch this video. You probably already know what allergies are, but it's pretty crazy that a nut can kill you. If you're putting nuts in your mouth, hopefully you're still able to breathe. For some people, when they put nuts in their mouth, they just can't breathe for the life of them. Whether or not you like having nuts shoved in your mouth, there's some people who get really allergic when you shove nuts in their mouth. In fact, it could even be considered a life-changing experience, or life-ending. But what makes peanuts an allergen? What is an allergen? What is an allergic reaction? Those are the questions that we're going to be answering in this video. An allergen is a type of antigen that is recognized by the antibodies in your immune system in order to produce an allergic reaction. An antigen is just something targeted by antibodies. Under normal circumstances, allergens should be harmless to the body. However, for some this is not the case. When some substance is an allergen, your body will perceive that substance as a threat to the body, but honestly, it just sounds like a biological skill issue. As such, your body will respond by fighting off the threat via the immune system. The body's reactions are called allergies, or allergic reactions. In theory, anything could be an allergen. It just depends on whether or not the immune system has developed an adverse reaction to it. While anything can technically be considered an allergen, there are some allergens that a lot more people tend to get than others. Since some of those happen to be more common, those are the ones that we're going to tend to focus on, and that you've probably heard about before. There are some irritating substances that are sometimes erroneously referred to as allergens, when they're not actually allergens. One example of a condition which isn't an allergy, but commonly gets referred to as an allergy, is celiac disease. However, this is just a digestive condition, and not an actual allergy. Celiac disease is a condition which is marked by sensitivity to gluten. Gluten is a protein that's made by a variety of grains, such as the ones shown here. One of my friends actually has celiac disease, but fortunately in Canada, it's pretty easy to prepare dishes and make sure that the things that we buy will have gluten listed as one of the ingredients, since we look out for people with allergies quite a bit here. If only I had a nickel for every time I had to prepare a dish for my friend. Oh, speaking of nickels. Nickel is a transition metal, and it's the fifth most abundant element on the planet. In some plants, bacteria, and fungi, nickel has key biological roles in acting as a metal cofactor for certain enzymes, such as ureases and nickel iron hydrogenases. Nickel is often used industrially in making stainless steel, rechargeable batteries, and it can be used as a substitute for decorative silver, since it's resistant to corrosion. Nickel and its compounds are classified as human carcinogens, and nickel allergy is caused by an increased exposure to nickel. This might happen through wearing nickel-plated jewelry. For instance, I used to have this nickel belt buckle I would wear, and anytime I'd wear this belt buckle, I would just start getting a red rash on my skin. So I just stopped wearing anything that was made of nickel, and that problem went away. The exposure of the skin to nickel causes the nickel to be presented to the T-cells, which will become stimulated and duplicate themselves, eventually reaching a threshold, causing the skin to develop a rash. Nickel allergies usually take the form of nickel allergy contact dermatitis, which causes a rash that appears bumpy or scaly. While the exact cause of nickel allergy is unknown, it is known that nickel is recognized by the immune system as a harmful substance. If I had a nickel for every time I said nickel, for everybody who watches this video, I would have enough nickels that I wouldn't need to have a Patreon, where you could support the channel, if you want, of course. So overall, nickel's definitely pretty irritating. Is it the most irritating one on this list? Probably not. I guess we could put nickel into, like, C tier. You can get contact dermatitis from it, but it's not, like, life-threatening. Also, if we're talking about the nickel, the nickel is, like, an F tier coin, because it's barely worth using, and all it does is take up space in your wallet. The IARC has classified nickel as a Group 2B carcinogen, which means that it's known to cause cancer in animals, and it's suspected to cause cancer in people. Getting cancer is pretty irritating, and since cancer starts with a C, why don't we put nickel into C tier? Beta-lactam antibiotics constitute a vital class of antibacterial agents characterized by the presence of a distinctive beta-lactam ring in their chemical structure. This category encompasses several antibiotic groups, such as penicillin and its derivatives, known as penams, cephalosporins, cephamycins, as well as their derivatives, referred to as cephems, monobactams, carbapenems, as well as carbacifum. Carbacifum. <laughs> their mechanism of action revolves around their ability to hinder the synthesis of peptidoglycan, specifically affecting gram-positive bacteria, thereby exhibiting bactericidal effects. These are widely used in combating various gram-positive and gram-negative infections. Beta-lactam antibiotics find application in treating conditions such as syphilis, streptococcal pharyngitis, and Neisseria meningitis infections. However, despite their effectiveness, certain individuals may manifest hypersensitivity reactions to penicillin and cephalosporins, with some reactions mediated by IgE, also known as immunoglobulin E, a key player in allergic responses to allergens. 
These reactions may result in manifestations such as hives, and if left untreated, can progress to severe anaphylaxis. It's worth noting that the side chains associated with the beta-lactam ring in penicillin significantly contribute to immunological recognition, playing a pivotal role in allergic cross-reactivity. Interestingly, this reactivity primarily stems from the side chains rather than the penicillin molecule or the beta-lactam ring itself. So since penicillin can give you anaphylaxis, that's pretty irritating. And if we had one less human in the world from an allergic reaction, that's pretty irritating. So we're going to have to put penicillins right into S tier. You might not have heard of this one before, but this is ninhydrin. Ninhydrin is a really useful reagent in chemistry, and it can be used to detect ammonia and amines, and this is exploited in forensics for detecting fingerprints. Ninhydrin may cause an allergic reaction, which results in IgE-mediated rhinitis, also known as inflammation of the nose, as well as asthma. One example of a case where a 41-year-old woman developed an allergy towards ninhydrin resulted in her developing rhinitis as well as difficulty breathing. They were able to show that her IgE levels almost doubled in response to ninhydrin, which is a pretty strong signal that she had developed an allergy to it. While this is only one case, it is one where there was constant exposure to ninhydrin, so it's probably not that common of an allergen. Is it irritating? It's a little bit irritating. It sure is irritating how much Sigma Aldrich charges for ninhydrin, but fortunately, there's less irritating alternatives. So overall, it's somewhat irritating, but it's pretty mild. So why don't we put ninhydrin right into D tier? D for doubled in response. Now, if you haven't been sharing these videos with anyone else, I'm going to bet that you're a little bit selfish. And in this video, we're not talking about selfishness, but we are talking about shellfishness. An allergy towards tropomyosin is known as a shellfish allergy. Tropomyosin is a two-stranded, alpha-helical coiled protein that is involved in muscle contraction along with troponin. Tropomyosin is also the primary allergen involved in shellfish allergies, and its frequency varies greatly by species. For example, the tropomyosin in vertebrate species is considered non-allergenic, while the tropomyosin found in crabs and shrimp is highly sensitive to allergic reactions. A mechanism of action has been proposed for tropomyosin, where large fragments of tropomyosin from shellfish are able to survive gastric digestion and enter the bloodstream, forming a 3D tertiary structure. Antibodies such as IgE would be produced in response to these regions of the tertiary structure, triggering a hypersensitivity response involving a rash in hives. I know for some people, shellfish allergies can be really bad and life-threatening. However, in some cases, it's just simply an inconvenience. So this one isn't going to be quite as irritating to everyone, but since some people are going to have a really adverse reaction to shellfish, I think we could probably put this one into like A tier. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? The next molecule will instantly be recognizable to the organic chemists in the audience. This is DCC. DCC stands for NN prime dicyclohexyl carbodiimide, and this is an organic molecule that's used to couple amino acids in the synthesis of peptides. It's also a useful dehydrating agent when preparing amides and esters, as well as nitriles, from the corresponding oxime. DCC is able to act as an inhibitor of the enzyme ATP synthase, where it binds to the C subunit in the F0 region, blocking protons from entering the C subunit, causing the F0 region to stop rotating and hindering the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is pretty important. DCC also acts as a potent allergen. Upon contact with the skin, it will cause a rash. DCC is able to cause a skin reaction three different ways. The first way is through the formation of dicyclohexyl urea, which just happens when DCC is exposed to water in the air. So that's able to irritate the skin on its own. Another way that it can be irritating is it can react with an amino group of proteins in the skin. And finally, it could also be covalently linked to carboxyl groups through proteins in the skin. So since DCC is a really good electrophile, that just means it reacts with nucleophiles. Protein has some nucleophiles in it, so it can react with them. That's bad, and that causes an immune response. This always gets hyped up really big in chemistry circles as being a really potent allergen sensitizer, but as far as I know, there haven't been any cases of deaths associated with DCC, but nonetheless, if you're working with anything that roughly resembles DCC or carbodiamides more broadly, it's probably a good idea to wear gloves, and you should also look and see if there's any case reports for sensitization to that in the past. So DCC, it's a bit irritating, it's got two C's in its name, that's irritating, why don't we put it into C tier? Another class of drugs that can cause an allergic reaction are known as the cure-all sulfa drug. Sulfa drugs possess a sulfonamide group. These medicines are used in antibiotics. Sulfa drugs are frequently used as antibacterial medicines as they're able to competitively inhibit dihydroteroate synthase, which is involved in folate synthesis for bacteria. This is able to inhibit bacteria from growing rather than actually killing it. Sulfa drugs are also involved in some allergic reactions. A key component in the hypersensitivity reaction to sulfa drugs is the arylamine group found in the N4 position in drugs such as sulfamethoxazole, sulfasalazine, and sulfadiazine. Other sulfa drugs do not contain this arylamine group. 
Non-aralamine sulfa drugs have been found to be safe for patients who are allergic to aralamine sulfa drugs. Within the sulfonamides, two components are involved in hypersensitivity reactions. The first is the N1 heterocyclic ring, which involves a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, and the second is the N4 nitrogen that may form reactive metabolites that could cause direct cytotoxicity or an immunological response. Sulfa drugs actually helped save my great grandma's life as she was in the hospital for many years before sulfa drugs came to Canada. She had an infection that lasted several months. Fortunately, the doctors there were able to get some sulfa drugs and she was able to make a full recovery and subsequently have my grandma, who had my mother, who had me. So sulfa drugs are pretty S tier in that sense. They also start with an S. However, they can be pretty irritating. If you're taking antibiotics, the last thing that you need is an immune response. So that's pretty irritating. Now you have to go back to the doctor, have another appointment. You have to go to the pharmacy, get an alternative. You have to figure out how you're going to treat this infection or maybe even identify the bacteria. That's pretty irritating. So I think we could put sulfa drugs right into S tier. Plus sulfa starts with an S. S for saving my great grandma. Another allergen that you might have heard of before is sulfites. Compounds that contain the sulfite ion with the molecular formula SO32-. Sulfites are often used as food preservatives or enhancers in the form of potassium bisulfite, sodium bisulfite, sodium sulfite, as well as some other forms, such as metabisulfite. Sulfites are found in many wines in order to stop fermentation. Allergic reactions to sulfites are very rare amongst the general population, but are counted among the top food allergens. Consumption of products that contain sulfites for those with a sulfite allergy experience a range of adverse clinical effects including dermatitis, hypotension, and asthmatic reactions, which in some cases can cause anaphylaxis, but this is relatively rare for sulfites. Some studies suggest that the mechanism of action of a sulfite allergy is due to the inadequate activity of the enzyme sulfite oxidase, which oxidizes sulfite to sulfate, resulting in the accumulation of sulfite, which causes cholinergic bronchoconstriction in some individuals. So while allergies to sulfites are relatively rare, I don't think it's too irritating. It's a little bit irritating that you can't have sulfites. Maybe that means you can't have some wines and beers or cider, for instance. Not being able to have cider would kind of suck. Since cider starts with a C, why don't we put sulfites right into C tier? Another common source of allergies is pollen and fruit. Pollen is a powdery substance produced by flowers and seed plants. Pollen is a gametophyte, which will produce the male gamete of plants. An allergy to pollen causes allergic rhinitis, also called hay fever. I used to have this happen a lot to me when I was younger, but it doesn't happen as much now that I'm older. Symptoms can often include a stuffy or runny nose, sneezing, and watery eyes. Sometimes I'd also get like dry eyes or like red eyes, but it really depends on the pollen. The worst pollen for me is pollen from this tree called a cottonwood tree. There's like a couple days every year here where all of the plants release their cottonwood seeds all at once, and I'm always tempted to light them on fire, but I haven't given in. At least not yet. <laughs> I had a bad experience, though, which I then didn't light anything on oh. fire for two years. Okay, why did you become scared of fire for two years? In Montreal, is sometime in the summer, there would be this big pollination thing. Everything would be covered in white fluff. But oh. we found out that if you light it on fire, the fire just, like, travels as, like, a wave down it. Right. It's, oh. it's a massive fire hazard. I don't yeah. know how yeah. it even, like, yeah. it's just okay. sitting around all the time. Yeah. I told my friend, like, if you're going to light it, make sure that you see the end of it. Like, it's not going to just spread out. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got you. He lit it, and then he comes to me and goes, uh, he's just freaking out because it just started, like, traveling. You yeah. try to stomp it out before you know it. It's covering, like, you know, an area that you can't, it's like huge. It was like along a fence. It was probably like from that wall, like twice the length there, there was yeah. like foot long fire, like flames. And like maybe like half the depth of this room to the point where you're like, you cannot stomp this out. You're just, the fire's just there. <laughs> The underlying mechanism of an allergic reaction to pollen involves IgE antibodies attaching to the allergen, then causing the release of inflammatory chemicals such as histamine to cause a physiological response. Cross-reactivity also occurs with pollen allergies, with it being linked to oral allergy syndrome. For example, people who are allergic to birch pollen may also have an allergic reaction to apple or potato skins. If you know that you're allergic to one or both of these things, I'd be interested to hear about it down in the comments. So being allergic to pollen is pretty irritating. I think I had to go on almost daily walks for two or three years before my allergies stopped getting as severe. So that's pretty irritating. Imagine being allergic to the air outside. That's pretty dumb. So for that reason, I think we could put pollen right into A tier. A for, ah, make it stop. FELD1 is a secretoglobin protein complex that, in cats, is encoded by the CH1 and CH2 genes. This protein is produced in cat saliva and sebaceous glands, located in their skin, and is the primary allergen on cats and kittens. It's worth noting, though, that there are eight cat allergens that are recognized by the World Health Organization. FELD1 is the most prominent. Cat allergies were the first allergies that I ever experienced as a kid. 
I remember we were playing this one Mario game on the N64 where you have to jump through paintings. It's like the one with Princess Peach's castle in it. You have to jump through paintings and collect stars. For some reason, I just can't remember the name of it for the life of me. Anyway, this story has nothing to do with that, but the people whose house we were at had a cat, and my eyes both swelled up to like the size of baseballs. It was terrible. Terrible. The only thing that I've found that helps is not seeing cats for like a year or two. Then my symptoms go down a little bit. Honestly, I probably only see cats one or two times per year, so it isn't too bad, and when it is bad, for instance, when I was visiting my sister's vet, I took allergy medicine just to minimize any possible symptoms. The symptoms of a cat allergy are caused by overexpression of a type 2 phenotype, TH2, which stimulates helper T cells to produce IgE due to the presence of specific cytokines. So fell D1, fell for feline, by the way, it's D1, so I'd be tempted to put it into D tier. Having a cat allergy is definitely not the cat's meow, not being able to see friends with cats is pretty irritating. I think we're going to have to put Fel D1 into like A tier. It's pretty irritating. If you've seen our plant irritant tier list, you're probably familiar with Urushiol. Urushiol is a mixture of organic compounds that are catechol derivatives. They are known to be responsible for the allergenic properties of plants such as poison ivy and poison oak. To achieve an allergic dermatitis reaction, Urushiol is first oxidized to create an orthoquinone, which has two carbonyl oxygens coming off of the benzene ring. It isn't really a benzene ring anymore now that it's oxidized, but this can react with a protein nucleophile, which triggers a reaction in the skin. Once Urushiol penetrates the skin, it's recognized by Langerhans. You might not know this, but Langerhans cells are actually found in the pancreas, and the only reason I know that is because I listened to a Weird Al song when I was in high school. Insulin, glucagon, coming from the islets of Langerhans. The Urushiol is presented to T-cells, which produce cytokines, causing inflammation and itchiness. If you've seen some of the pictures of the allergic reaction that people get to Urushiol, it's no joke. This is extremely irritating. This has to go right into S tier. Most of the time people use nitrile gloves nowadays, and that's because a lot of people can develop an allergy to latex. Latex is a milky fluid found in many plants that's used in the production of rubber. It's an emulsion of polymer microparticles in water, most often used in making gloves, balloons, and mattresses. Those with a latex allergy are allergic to the proteins present in natural latex, and allergic reactions may range from type 1 hypersensitivity, the most serious form of reaction, to type 4 hypersensitivity, which is the least serious. The allergy itself is caused by latex allergens cross-linking with specific IgE antibodies located on allergic effector cells, mast cells, and basophils, which allows for the release of histamine, which causes immediate symptoms. Having to buy a specific type of gloves is a little bit irritating. Overall, I think that this could be circumvented with the choice of the appropriate gloves. It is still a little bit annoying though, so why don't we put it right into D tier. The organic chemists among you will be very familiar with isocyanates, but you might not be. An isocyanate is a functional group with the formula R single bond N double bond C double bond O. Certain isocyanates, such as methyl diphenyl diisocyanate, are used in producing surface coatings in rigid foams, in the form of polyurethanes. They're also used in producing paint coatings and varnishes. Isocyanates are produced from amines via phosgenation. Yes, apparently, using phosgene now gets its own word. I have been phosgenated. Thank you for phosgenating your amines. Timmy, did you phosgenate your amines before going to bed? No, Mom, I'll do it in the morning. Timmy, you have to do it tonight. You have to make polyurethane tomorrow. Okay. Isocyanates are also common intermediates in Hoffman rearrangement reactions, which is a way to convert a primary amide into a one carbon shorter isocyanate. An isocyanate allergic reaction is caused by exposure to isocyanates through inhalation, ingestion, or skin contact. Skin contact will result in a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, resulting in allergic contact dermatitis. So I think that some of these are definitely a lot worse than others. Some of the scarier ones would be like methyl isocyanate, which was involved in the Bhopal disaster. If we're talking about that kind of isocyanate, this would definitely be an S tier irritant. But if we're only getting a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, this wouldn't be rated as heavily. Since isocyanates span a broad class of different reagents, I think we're going to have to put it into S tier just to be safe. S for safe. There's tiny creatures living all over your body. If you look with a microscope into your eyebrows, you might even find some mites there as well. Dust mites are small insects that feed on dead skin cells and thrive in warm settings. They're often found in the dust in your home, hence the name. A dust mite allergy is caused by the droppings of dust mites. The gut of a dust mite contains potent digestive enzymes such as peptidase 1 that are preserved in their feces and induce allergic reactions such as wheezing, bronchial asthma, and atopic dermatitis. Tropomyosin is also found in dust mites, though it's only a minor allergen. It's thought that exposure to inhaled tropomycin proteins from dust mites is the primary sensitizer to the shellfish allergy. Dust mites are one of those things I try to completely forget about existing until I have to. 
I took a class in med micro once and after you plate your mouth bacteria and you just look at what's really inside of you under a microscope, it's pretty insane to see all the life that's there. So being allergic to dust mites, that would be a little bit irritating. Dust starts with a D, why don't we put it right into D tier. I'm a big fan of methyl salicylate. I like those lifesavers that smell like methyl salicylate, wintergreen oil, and a salicylate is the anionic form of salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is a precursor to aspirin. It's also a plant hormone, naturally found in some fruits, and is found as an ingredient in anti-acne products. Salicylate modulates the enzymatic activity of cyclooxygenase 1, COX-1, which is used in the conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2, which plays a role in inflammation and pain. NSAIDs are able to target cyclooxygenase 1, and there are some different NSAIDs which are more selective for COX-1 versus COX-2, which could lead to the development of stomach ulcers. One method for the underlying mechanism for aspirin hypersensitivity explains that when those who have an aspirin allergy of salicylate sensitivity are exposed to salicylate, cyclooxygenase 1 is blocked, which then causes the overproduction of leukotrienes, which are inflammatory molecules that tighten the airways in the lungs. The important thing to note is that aspirin and salicylic acid actually have different methods of inhibiting COX-1. While salicylic acid is able to bind to COX-1, acetylsalicylic acid is able to covalently react with COX-1, acetylating it, and permanently making it no longer able to function. So that protein has to be broken down, and another COX receptor has to be prepared before that cell is able to receive the same signals as before. Overall, it seems like it's a little bit frustrating. So I think that means that we're going to have to put salicylates and aspirin into like C tier. It's not too severe, but if it tightens the airways in the lungs and you have a severe reaction, then that would probably go right into S tier. If you're allergic to mold spores, you're probably allergic to serine proteases. A spore is a unit of sexual reproduction for plants and fungi for sexual or asexual reproduction, adapted for dispersal and survival. A mold allergy is caused when one breathes in the spores produced by mold and can cause a hay fever along with a runny nose, sneezing, and coughing. To date, 77 mold allergens have been described and officially recognized with different associated protein families. The most prominent are proteases, which are found in most mold species. Serine proteases consist of a catalytic triad of amino acids. For example, serine, histidine, and aspartate in chymotrypsin. The composition of the catalytic site may change depending on the enzyme. They cleave the proteins through the hydroxyl group of serine, acting as a nucleophile, attacking the carbonyl group of a peptide bond of a substrate. In rare circumstances, some people have an illness called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, where there is both an infection and an inflammatory reaction to mold. Getting a fungal infection of the lungs sounds pretty irritating, plus serine also starts with an S, so we can put mold spores right into S tier. If you've ever been stung by a bug, you know how irritating it is. One time when I was growing up, my sister got a bee under her dress and it stung her in the butt. As a kid, I thought that that was the funniest thing ever. It wasn't irritating for me, but I'm sure that my sister will be irritated now that I shared that story. An insect sting allergy is the allergic response to the bite or the sting of an insect. No, really. Really? Stinging insects like bees, wasps, and some ants will inject venom into their victims, which contain phospholipidase A, hyaluronidase, and histamine to generate a response. Biting insects like mosquitoes and ticks will often inject anticoagulants such as the protein anophelin, which binds to thrombin, preventing the blood from clotting. Similar to other allergies, those with an insect sting allergy will produce antibodies like IgE to produce an allergic response in order to protect the body, either through itching, hives, or anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis can be life-threatening, so insect stings can go right into S tier. Seriously, insects are so annoying. It's so annoying getting bitten by a mosquito, a wasp, getting stung by a bee. There's just no insect that you really want biting you. You know, I'm going to irritate you a little bit <laughs> and ask you to subscribe. In this video, we discussed a number of different allergens which impact the human body. A number of allergens work through the activation of IgE, which is a type of antibody, triggering an immune response. As we mentioned earlier, there are some conditions such as celiac disease which aren't a true allergy, but actually a digestive condition. Hopefully this video has helped you understand allergies a little bit better than you did before. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Bam, there you go.